our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Amen. Amen. Maybe see Amen. So, you know what? I haven't preached all year. Oh, boo. All year. <laughs> I know it's February, but I was just completely out of here that whole month of January, as you guys, I'm sure, know. Um, and this scripture, uh, I'm going to read to you again from 2 Corinthians, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. In other words, if you get it, you got to give it. That's, that's the title of the sermon, Jack, if that's what it is. If you get it, you got to give it. Okay. So, you know, everybody's been saying, well, it seems like there's been things going on with vision recently. You know, lots of people have been struggling with their vision or having eye troubles. One, certainly one just me. I think we counted at least five people that we know um, um, personally who have had high problems. And it didn't all happen, you know, right away either because uh, Susan's been dealing with her eyes for quite a while. And so is James Ramsey and so is Wanda as well too. So um, I was a relative newcomer to that club. Club? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but maybe there are things going on. People have said, well, is God trying to show us something in that? Is there something that we're supposed to see? Get it? Ha -ha. Okay. Well, perhaps. And um, I do believe that God is trying to teach us something or to tell us things in this. Um, there's spiritual things going on. We know that all the time, but there's spiritual things happening, and we all need to be putting up our antenna and listening carefully to God. And though there may be a whole lot more that I'm going to share with you today, I will share my experience with you, and uh, you know we'll go from there. But as you know, about four weeks ago, just after New Year's, I had a retinal detachment in my right eye. And uh, all of a sudden, couldn't see part of stuff out of that eye. And so I wound up having emergency surgery for that, where they use a laser and then they put in this gas bubble. And of course, you remember I had to keep my head like this for seven whole days. I mean, that was 24 hours a day for seven days. And it's not easy. But, and, you know, as he was saying that before the surgery, I think there's no way I can do that. And you know you probably think that in yourself. There's no way I can do that. But you know what? You can. Yeah. You know you can. Now there were times during that that I would give my right eye to be able to lift my head. <laughs> <laughs> no, not quite. I wouldn't because that's why I didn't. You know. But that's what allows the retina to heal and to go back into its place. And after that, he let me start. You know, looking up. I could look straight ahead. I could still only lay on one side at night, but it certainly got a lot easier, but I still couldn't do anything. They didn't want me doing anything pretty much for the last three weeks. And just as of this weekend, I'm released to do anything. So I can do it all now. <laughs> but it was, uh, you know, a long time. And I haven't, well, I know that I haven't had four weeks off in a row uh, in at least 10 years, but um, <laughs> yeah, I haven't had four weeks where I did nothing, <laughs> probably in my life. I was able to look at TV, you know, and so I cut up on an awful lot of series, I'll tell you that. But um, there was an awful lot of time on my hands, as you can imagine, you know, and with that time on my hands, I was saying, okay, God, what do you want? Obviously, you wanted my attention here, and so you've got something to tell me or to that I learn from you on this. Now, Casey, though she's not here today, but she shared with me uh, one of the things that, you know, uh, she had read about this and what she had picked out from somewhere was that a detached retina symbolizes the ma spiritual manifestation of holding on to something that maybe I've seen that needs to be let go and placed in the hands of God. And, you know, that certainly struck a chord with me. And I, I think that there's truth in that on several levels, okay? And I'll just go into a couple levels with you. You know, I certainly prayed about that, and uh, God did start showing me some things. 
And you know, the, the thing about sight is, and the thing about seeing is that once you see something, you can't unsee it. You know, you're, you will remember that image in your head, no matter what you do, you can't make it go away. Um, and God reminded me of some images from Africa that I saw, which were traumatic and that they affected me deeply. And uh, I needed to let those things go. And so I've certainly been praying and uh, giving those things to God and working on that. And that's one of those levels, I think. Um, but when again, with all this time on my hands, there was sort of a problem that I had. And that is that by my nature and the job that I do, I like to analyze symptoms. It's not that I like to, I kind of have to. And so I was analyzing my own symptoms. And that was a problem. Because you know what, honestly, okay, I'm gonna share this with you. I don't know much about eye problems. I just don't, I don't know anything about eye problems. So I was really in the dark <laughs> about what was going on with me and what I was experiencing after this surgery, you know? And uh, um, there's a saying, you know, at least we use in medicine, probably in other areas, you know, uh, I know just enough to be dangerous. You've heard that before, right? Well, in this case, I know just enough to be anxious. <laughs> and that's kind of how it was. I was getting anxious about things. And uh, yeah, I just said anxious and not dangerous because I won't treat myself. You know, I'm not going to do that. There's an old proverb that says, he who treats himself has a fool for a physician. <laughs> so I don't do that. I didn't take drops on my own without the doctor's order, did I? No. <laughs> and so I did what I was supposed to do. Um, but I was still anxious, okay? And thinking about all the possible things that could go wrong and what that means and what does that little light mean? And what does that thing floating around there mean? And, you know, all of this stuff going on. Why is it kind of blurry or weird over here, you know? And you know what? That kept me up at night. It was kind of hard. Not, not just to mention, you know, for the first week having to lay this way all the time. Fortunately, I had a special pillow, but still you felt like you were smothering sometimes. So I've been fighting some fear and some anxiety through all this. Fear of going blind, you know, because, you know, it actually comes to you. I could go blind. And I found that the only way to effectively fight that, fight that anxiety was to praise God. Even in my own mind, just think, okay, hallelujah, hallelujah. I praise you, Lord. You are so good. You're so gracious. I love you, Lord. Seeking him more and more. These were the things that I had to do in order to fight that anxiety away, make it go away. This was especially noticeable at night and going to sleep, not knowing what you're going to be able to see when you wake up. You remember a few years ago, um, well, actually, we've had quiet days several different times, but a few years ago, we had one quiet day that was memorable to me because during that time, I was lifted up to heaven during probably just 20 minutes when we were sitting here quiet. Maybe it was the third heaven, you know, like Paul experienced possibly, but um, it was so overwhelming during that time to be in the presence of God. He was on the throne, you know, and all I could do during that time was just cry glory, 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 just over and over and over again. And so I was seeking God in this time that I had and asking for that again, asking, you know, Lord, bring me up into heaven. And it hasn't been quite like that. Can't say that I experienced that same thing in these recovery hours that I had when things get dark and uncertain. But while praising Jesus in those times and asking for more, a peace would wash over me and calm would come. And those other circular thoughts would flee away. You know the ones I'm talking about. What if? You know, what if, yeah, but what if, yeah, but what if, you know, and they just keep going. Well, praising Jesus and asking to go deeper in him would make those go away. So he comforted me greatly during this time. And that's the principle that's described in our Old Testament lesson today from Habakkuk, who said it just right. <laughs> we talked about that. Habakkuk 3.18 says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be 
joyful in God my Savior. That is, no matter what happens, right? Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the crop fields fail and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. Now you've heard that scripture before. In fact, there's this song about it, which thank you, you didn't do today, but that's okay. Rejoice in the Lord always. I can I say rejoice. You remember that one. Okay. But the message here is pretty simple and clear. Okay. Rejoicing and praising God in tough times is key, not only to fighting the enemy away, but for your very survival. <laughs> You see, because rejoicing and praising him are essential to that relationship with God. you got to do it. Yes, rejoicing does fight off the enemy. I mean, he can't stand to hear you praise God. He can't stand it when we praise him together in worship. And he runs off with his tail between his legs. But more importantly, praise is how we relate to God. You say, well, how do we relate to God? How do I relate to God? Well, we relate through Jesus, right? I mean, that's why he came. We relate through prayer because, well, we know that's how we talk to God. And if we know, you know, prayer, then we know it's that thing that Father Bill has taught us many times over called ACTS, A-C-T-S, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplications. I'm going to call it praise and confession, thanksgiving, and intercession. Those are the things that we bring to God when we pray. And they prepare us for that next step, which is listening to God for what he has to say to us. Because it doesn't stop with acts, it just begins with the acts thing. Listening, this is how we relate to God. And I would put to you, that if, aren't doing, if you aren't doing these things, you aren't in relationship with God. <laughs> You say, well, I know he's there and I'll call on him. If things get tough, we kind of have an arrangement, you know. But that's not relating, okay? Now, during all of this time uh, of the, my recovery and all that kind of stuff, my brother has called me two or three times, you know. And normally, I talk to my brother about once or twice a year, which is not great, right? And I need to call him. I need to call him, okay? So, remind me. But... <laughs> See, my brother lives in Illinois, and I know he's there, you know, I know he's there, but unless I talk to him, I'm not really in relationship with him, am I? It's the same way with Jesus. If you're not talking to him and interacting with him and relating to him and praising him and giving him glory, you're not really in relationship with him. So that's all just an aside. You can take that just a little freebie there. But you see, praising him in bad times is also a statement. It's a statement saying that you trust God, that you place yourself in his hands. Now, it doesn't help to grumble at God when you have a bad day, because you know what? He didn't cause it. But praising him when you're having a bad day puts the devil to flight, and it changes you like it changed me. So, but here's the final point of all this, okay? Here's the point, and that is we receive comfort when we praise God in good times and in bad, alone and when we're with others like this. It's a letting go of your self-will and your self-reliance. <clears throat> Praising him in bad times is putting your situation and your problem, your very life in his hands. And that reliance on God, not just a personal thing, a personal comfort for you, though it is. But it is necessary as we relate to other people, too. And that brings me to the second point about all of this. So I made a mistake with this whole ordeal with my eye. It was a real blunder. So when it first started happening, they asked me what my job was and where I worked, you know, and I said, well, I'm a physician assistant and I work at the urgent care. I never mentioned that I was a priest. 
And in the short meetings, because they're usually always short with the specialists that I have, I never expressed my faith. You know, I had the opportunity to give God the glory and to share it with the doctor and the nurse. And I didn't. I feel so stupid. It's stupid. And then we get this uh, gospel reading for today that says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In that same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. We're supposed to let our light shine, and I hid it under a bowl. Stupid, stupid, stupid. See, when he says that, because that's part of the Sermon on the Mount, that's the next thing that he says right after what you heard last week, which were the Beatitudes. Okay, we're still in the same place, and he's speaking to his disciples primarily here. He isn't just asking us to consider or to think about hmm, praying for people. It's not a suggestion or a request. It's a command. It fits in under that thing called love God and love your neighbor. You see, this is like the essential job function for a Christian. It's the job of a Christian, if you like Star Trek. It's the prime directive. Notice that I specifically said pray for people because that's where your light will shine, okay? That's where Jesus is. That's how you show people Jesus. Now, I'd rather you show Jesus to people and tell him about it. Tell him about him. Showing him happens when you pray for them in his name. Then he can show up and do cool stuff. Now, anybody can be nice to someone, you know? I mean, that's not real light of the world stuff, you know? Yeah, you can be nice to people, but you need to go a step further than that. And maybe you're already doing this praying for people's stuff, you know? But if you are, and something happens, share it with us, because we really all need to hear something encouraging. Mm -hmm. Now, um, maybe like me, we sometimes let that humility thing get in the way and prefer to pray in secret. It's okay to do that. But how does God get the glory if no one knows? Jesus said, you will do even greater things than these. And the disciples did, and Christians do. But in all the examples in the New Testament, it's clear that Jesus gets the credit. And in my situation, I missed the opportunity with my doctor. You know what? Because he, at my last appointment, was amazed at how much vision I got back. I did much better than he expected. Hallelujah. Man, I could have shared with him right then about God. Stupid, stupid. It could have been an opportunity for me to show Jesus. Let the light shine. Let my light shine because that's how Jesus puts it. It's my light. It's your 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 light. Now, fortunately, I have another chance because I'll see him again in a month. In fact, I'll probably see him a few more times before it's all done. I'm supposed to have a couple more surgeries at some point. So you see, we don't let our light hide under a bowl. We're to share it and to show it. Yeah, it's really his light. You know, I know that. But he gave it to us, and it's our light, and he said it is. Now, even if you pray in secret for somebody, that's great, but check back in with them, and if something changes, tell them you prayed for them. The other thing you can do is just share what you think God wants for a person, or what he might be saying to them. You say, well, nobody cares what I think. Okay, but you know what? You're in Christ. And there's probably a better chance that you're going to share what God is saying than some other person off the street because you're in Christ. 
It's got to be closer than some busybody who would tell me, oh, you need to leave him, or I'd take him to court if I were you, or I could never forgive her for it. She did that to me. You can speak the word of God to people just in small little times. And if you need a check to make sure that you're on track, you know, well, you know, God's only going to say things that line up with scripture. So if it lines up with that, there's an easy little check for you. You can go ahead and share it. As you do it more and more, it'll get easier and easier. And it's going to show Jesus to people. You don't even have to tell them. Now they'll ask later then something happens. And maybe nothing does happen when that happens. You know what? The words just pass right over them. Okay, sure. But maybe the words cut right through. Maybe they cut through the pain and they wash over them with the grace of God and his comfort. And they receive comfort then too. That's what's called the word of knowledge. You know, it's worth the risk doing that. You remember that miracles and signs, uh, you know, showing Jesus, what I'm talking about, or uh, really less about giving somebody something and more about demonstrating the kingdom of God. That's why he does those. Yeah, he wants to feed everyone, sure, like the loaves and fishes, but that food got eaten up. Jesus loved doing that feeding, by the way, you know what? But he would rather give people bread that lasts forever in the form of his body and his saving grace. They need it more than a meal. So remember, whoever drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water that I shall give will never thirst. The water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. It's time for us to show Jesus, okay? You know, I don't have to tell you, but I'm going to tell you, God is real. Jesus is real. All this stuff that we come and we do here, this is not to get closer to God. This is a response to God. We're already close to God. We've got it all inside of us. We are in Christ. And he really does offer us comfort and peace in troubled times and in good times. And we are all going to absolutely need it to get through our lives. But it doesn't stop there. We have to share that comfort and that peace that we experience with others. It's an imperative. It's the prime directive. And this little scripture, the one I started with at the very beginning, I'm going to share with you. You know, you could read over this a uh, hundred times and you wouldn't think anything about it because it's just part of Paul's introduction to the Romans in his second letter. And he says, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. That's a lot of comfort. To simplify it, I'll say this. If you get it, you got to give it. That's what God wants us to see in all of this. That's what he was teaching me and we're learning. There are probably more things that he wants to teach us in vision, but that's one of them right there. If we get it, we got to give it. You see, in the bad times, we can call on Jesus. We can praise him. We can make the enemy flee like a wounded dog. We can be comforted by God when the fields are bare, when the cattle all die, or when you can't see out of your right eye. When that happens to someone else, especially an unbeliever, because the believers have all of this themselves, right? You know, you can share that same comfort with them in their trouble. You can pray for them. You can share what God is saying to them. You're his mouthpiece. You can let your light shine. It surpasses anything else found on the earth. If you get it, you got to give it. 
That's the point. Second Corinthians 1 4, he comforts us in all our troubles that we may comfort others. When we're troubled, we'll be able to give them the same comfort that God has. That's the New Living Translation. He comforts us in all our troubles that we can comfort others. You know, that's why he comforts us, so we can comfort others. When they're troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us, like he gave me, and like I need to give someone else. And you do too. Be comforted, brothers and sisters, and share that comfort. If you get it, you got to give it. Amen. Yeah. <clears throat> <clears throat> Thank you.